Brothers and sisters, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Then an argument broke out among them, the apostles, about which of them should be regarded as the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in authority over them are addressed as benefactors. Among you it shall not be so. Rather, let the greatest among you be as the youngest, and the leader as the servant. For who is greater, the one seated at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one seated at table? I am among you as the one who serves. So there you have it, my friends, at least the beginning of the reason why we are here at the ninth annual Servant Leadership Day, a celebration of Seton Hall University's commitment to forming students as servant leaders in a global society. Our time together this afternoon is sponsored by the Center for Vocation and Servant Leadership and the Office of Mission and Ministry, and it is made possible by the generous, generous benefaction of Colleen and Hank D'Alessandro. Our purpose is to provide inspiration this afternoon to the Center's Servant Leader Scholars and to all here at Seton Hall dedicated to the principles and practices of servant leadership. Robert Greenlee, founder of the modern movement of servant leadership, created the ultimate measure of one's impact as a servant leader by raising several questions that formed his best test. We have with us this afternoon, Mr. Reginald Lewis, who's recently joined us here on campus as the inaugural executive director of the centers of the Greenleaf Center's the new home here at Seton Hall. Mr. Uh, Lewis also serves as an adjunct professor in the university core. He brings an extensive background in the philanthropic, nonprofit, state and municipal government and higher education sectors to his current role. Mr. Lewis holds a master's in social service administration from the University of Chicago. Mr. Lewis will build on the center's 56 year history to advance the awareness, understanding and practice of servant leadership. And we are most grateful to have him with us this afternoon. As a reminder, there will be time for questions after Mr. Lewis's uh, shared thoughts with us. Um, you can write them in the chat function. So without a further ado, uh, Mr. Lewis, thank you. Thank you, Father Colin, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, I remain grateful to you and all the members of the, the team who make up the Center for Vocation and Servant Leadership just down the hall from us here. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to the day when all of us can finally just actually walk right next door and maybe just tap each other on the elbows. How about that? Special thanks as well to some very special people who made today possible. Uh, Stacia Taylor here in the Provost's office, uh, Francia Peterson, Walter Jackson, and Priscilla Phoebus from my team. Good afternoon to my Seton Hall family, uh, faculty, staff, invited guests, and last but certainly not least, uh, our servant leader scholars, uh, thank you for your presence on this rainy Thursday. Like all annual Servant Leader Day gatherings in prior years, our 2021 program, as Father Colin mentioned, it really allows us the time to carve out a moment of reflection to more deeply uh, grapple with the philosophy of servant leadership um, and how this philosophy brings greater relevance uh, to our lives, how we might live out our lives in a more meaningful way. For this year's event in particular, I am especially eager to engage our servant leader scholars throughout the campus around the theme of the case for 
the best test. Now, you should know that Father Colin told me that there will be some consequences if I do not get you all through at least 35 minutes. Uh, but I promise you that we will have some opportunities to at least engage in some dialogue. But today I want to talk about this case, this case for the best test. Some 50 plus years ago, the namesake of our center, Robert K. Greenleaf, not only as Father Colin mentioned, helped to create what is known as the modern movement of servant leadership, but he developed a manner in which the impact of individuals and organizational service might be measured. He called it the best test. Using a series of questions, Greenleaf challenged us to assess our work with, arguably, the best gauge as to whether those being served are indeed better off as a result of one's leadership. So today, I do extend Greenleaf's invitation to rethink and reimagine the notion of helping others in order to raise the standard for serving. Now, this goes beyond our typical way of talking about serving others. In essence, what I'm suggesting is that our casual feel-good acts should be tied to a higher bar, a better test, the best test. Individuals and organizations should strive to leave people and or institutions better off than found, right? Let's look at the invitation. Next slide. Do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit? or at least not be further deprived. It is important to note here that Robert Greenleaf actually wrote several versions of the best test. The one most often cited was actually used to promote and advertise this year's program, the one read by Father Colin. But today, as we talk about the best test, I'm extending that invitation to include Greenleaf's final, the 1980 version, which has the additional sentence found in bold, no one knowingly, no one will knowingly be hurt by the action directly or indirectly. Now that's a lot, right? Especially on a rainy Thursday. But Greenleaf himself admitted that the best test is actually difficult to administer. However, in the spirit of a philosophy of leadership that places emphasis on the optimal growth and well being of others, I believe this test remains the most appropriate standard to strive for. A bit later, we'll spend some time unpacking the questions that constitute the standard. But before we go any further, let's not assume that we all share the same understanding about not only Robert Greenleaf, but the way in which servant leadership is defined in itself. Next slide. Our center is, of course, named after Robert K. Greenleaf, which he founded in 1964 as the Center for Applied Ethics. Now, at the time of the founding of our center, Greenleaf had actually retired from a vibrant 38-year career at at and He was at and first director of management research, where he supported the training and development of leaders and managers for the company. The quality of leadership experienced by employees, as he learned, would become the most de important determinant on the motivation and well being of employees. That informed his ability to release his essay in 1970, known as The Servant as Leader, in which he made the argument that effective leaders were those who most strongly prioritize their followers, and their communities. Greenleaf states, the servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. Now that's different, 
right? That's different, as Greenleaf reminds us, from one who is leader first, especially if in being oriented to lead first, the motivation hinges on a quest for power and material possession. But too often, practitioners tend to talk about what servant leaders look like without really distinguishing what makes this particular leadership philosophy different and potentially more effective. Servant leadership is a set of behaviors and practices that run counter to the traditional power leadership model. Instead of people working to serve the leader, the leader actually exists to serve the people. And while similar to other leadership approaches, servant leadership is truly oriented around the leader's primary focus on the well-being of followers, be they employees or say constituents in a political sense or more simply stated, just stakeholders. Next slide. Here are some other ways in which you might think about servant leadership versus other leadership models. Looking on the left side of the page, the left column, we typically think about leadership in traditional in the traditional sense of command and control. Just picking out a few of these positional authority, might makes right, my way is better, or as my grandma would say, my way or the highway. <laughs> People are tools, the end justifies the means, who screwed up? Forgive me, Father. Servant leadership. Servant leadership is about moral authority putting people first, putting organizations first, empowering others, welcoming feedback, building consensus, seeking solutions and not the blame. Next slide. It is important also to think about characteristics or traits that we'd like to mention with respect to servant leaders and their ability to manifest this practice. These are characteristics that are really a way of being and it should also be understood an issue often raised by students in my courses. Servant leaders are not necessarily experts in all of these characteristics. In truth, to carry out the practice of servant leadership, one has to constantly evolve. Let's quickly go through some of these listening. Servant leaders have a deep commitment to listening intently. Now, how many times have we asked, or I should say have been guilty of asking someone a question without even waiting for the answer. How are you today? Followed by a quick, that's good. Perhaps leaving the person who just said, I'm really having a bad day. Wondering if you truly care about them since you obviously missed that opportunity to listen. Among my favorite Greenleaf comments about listening include, true listening builds strength in other people. And only a true servant, a true natural servant, automatically responds to any problem by listening first. There's also awareness, constantly being strengthened by awareness of self. And servant leaders have this strong sense of conditions around them. They remain vigilant and abreast of societal affairs, near and far. Empathy, boy, don't we need more of that? Servant leaders strive to understand and share the feelings of others. Servant leaders are not indifferent to what is happening to others. Servant leaders also accept people for who they are. And during times of crises in particular, we often yearn for empathic leadership. We do want to know that the people who are in charge understand and identify with our needs. Healing. We should be on another slide. The process of becoming emotionally and physically healthy. Greenlee suggests that healing is really about a search for wholeness, always something being sought. Healing is a powerful force of personal and communal transformation. Leaders don't shy away from using words to unite, seek common ground and bring us together. There's also conceptualization, Dreaming great dreams, the leader must think beyond day-to-day -day realities of a role in order to shape a bold vision, a bold vision for transformation. Greenleaf once stated, nothing much happens without a dream. 
or for something big to happen, there must be a really big dream. Persuasion. Servant leaders rely on persuasion rather than positional authority in making decisions. Servant leaders are always fostering growth in the development of others. There's also foresight, a characteristic that enables servant leaders to understand lessons from the past, realities of the present, and the likely consequence of a decision in the future. Servant leaders place high regard on the events of the moment, constantly comparing them with actions and decisions made in the past, while also considering consequences of the future. Greenleaf can come off a bit harsh here, once stating that the failure of a leader to foresee may be viewed as an ethical failure. And yet we can see the damage caused by ethical fa failures. I'll cite one in particular a little later. Stewardship and building community, the careful and responsible oversight of something entrusted in one's care. As most of you know, stewardship is a reference often used in connection with the environment, but it's also about the care we place in regards to institutions trust, entrusted in our care. Building community, servant leaders look for ways to build and establish connectedness, especially across geographic, social, economic, racial, and ethnic lines. I think Greenleaf would clearly be disturbed by the polarization in our society today, the divisiveness, this unrelenting us against them. Next slide. Greenleaf was also quite concerned about the role of institutions. And by that, I mean all institutions, particularly businesses, the university, and the church. He firmly believed that while being that the well-being of society largely hinged on these and other institutions working well. And what he called his credo, he states, if a better society is to be built, one more just and more caring and providing opportunity for people to grow, the most effective and economical way, while supportive of the social order, is to raise the performance the performance as servants of as many institutions as possible by new voluntary regenerative forces initiated within them by committed individuals, servants. Let's now go or delve more deeply into the best test. Servant leadership. Francia, you can go to the next slide. Servant leadership is a people oriented approach in which the only thing that is ultimately that ultimately really matters, at least according to Greenleaf, is how one measures their impact on others. The best test helps to determine individual and organizational growth. And yes, it is difficult to administer. Do those being served grow as persons? Do they grow healthier? Servant leaders are committed to the overall health and well being of individuals and organizations. On the individual level, Greenleaf tells us that everything, everything begins with the individual. As individuals become healthier in all ways, they can heal organizations. They are positioned to become regenerative forces within those organizations. Organizations also take into account the best interests of employees to have adequate supports in maintaining mental, emotional, and physical health. But beyond ensuring the availability and access to, say, strong employer coverage, servant leaders also are always attentive to the moral and climate, the morale and climate of an organization. If people want to be someplace, you'll see that in higher levels of retention and employee engagement. If folks feel valued and take emotional ownership. They'll bring their best selves to the workplace. Vibrant organizations embrace the views, the values and strengths of everyone. And we all know, we all have been, I should say, in places, and we all know what happens when people don't feel valued, when they don't feel as though that they have adequate benefits and supports. How do you fully capture or quantify the loss of potential 
the damage to the organization, the damage to the very communities touched by the organization when people are not nurtured and supported in their growth and development. Wiser, you can go back Francine. The servant leader seeks to build capacity to sharpen and improve our ability to discern, to improve judgment informed by experience and reflection, to develop a desire to know, an intellectual curiosity, if you will, to apply a standard for determining truth and ascertaining facts, and using those facts and data to support truth. And becoming wiser, this is not about any of us having all the answers. After all, Greenleaf was always challenging us to practice becoming more self-aware, listening better, and constantly reflecting. On the last portion of this, free and more autonomous, servant leaders support the development of one's capacity to become more independent, self-determining. Servants nurture and support the development of ideas and creative energies throughout an organization. Servant leaders are especially keen on encouraging and supporting the freedom to question. As servants, you're not threatened by the questions. You invite all questions. You invite, you invite all voices. They encourage the ability to make decisions that may be outside the boundaries of tradition or status quo. This is a way of measuring impact. Next. And then what if we are encouraging those that we are serving to become more likely to serve themselves? With that autonomy mentioned earlier, a greater sense of freedom is embraced and valued. The servant is committed to build the capacity of others so that they choose to serve and choose to lead when called. Leadership, I don't need to tell you, leadership is hard. Servant leadership is even harder. So for those who profess to stay on this path, are we inspiring and preparing others to do the same? And what of the effect on the least privilege in society? Servant leaders make that intentional, that intentional effort to see, to see the most marginalized, to raise a collective consciousness about those tied to generational cycles of poverty, locked out of opportunities and pathways necessary to contribute to society and realize lives of promise. Greenleaf would have us to take that unusual step of viewing those suffering from structural inequities as stakeholders as well. And then what about making certain that we don't inflict intentional harm? Servant leaders strive to intentionally raise the bar in that regard. The use of the best test as a higher standard necessitates taking that sometimes uncomfortable, courageous, even lonely step of raising questions about the value and efficacy of our efforts more than checking the box, fulfilling the requirement. Have I, have we considered everything to avoid harm? I'm willing to lean on the promise of this approach as a way to achieve a more just and caring society as indicated by Greenleaf's credo. But please, again, on this rainy Thursday, don't just take my word for it. Some of you still may not be convinced that this isn't more than just a soft, feel-good approach with very little evidence to show for it. Yet there are solid examples of companies and other organizations that have embraced this philosophy, this philosophy and managed to maintain strong profits, higher employee engagement, and high levels of employee retention. Next slide. Here are just a few examples. Starbucks has grown in its profitability in all but five of the business quarters between 2006 and 2019. The Greenleaf Center was fortunate to recently host Howard Bahar, 
the former president of Starbucks International, in a recent webinar where we learned about how the coffee giant expanded from 28 stores to 15,000 stores spanning five continents. Bahar made it clear throughout this enormous period of growth, the company created and sustained a culture that supports the well being of employees, customers, and the very communities being served. Then there's Whole Foods, operating in this very difficult business climate of retail food service where limited benefits, working conditions, and um, long, unpredictable hours lead to what's known as that steady churn and turnover of workers. And yet Whole Foods has managed to create a more conducive working environment that values a team approach and the well-being of all team members. In 2012, Whole Foods made it to the Forbes 100 best companies to work for list in America. Southwest Airlines has also leveraged the philosophy of servant leadership, investing in their employees, the well-being of their employees, who in turn value service for those who fly. The Cleveland Clinic. In 2008, the Cleveland Clinic one of the world's premier healthcare institutions launched an organizational development process that increased employee engagement and improved the overall patient experience. It is widely recognized as a leading medical innovator that promotes, promotes a culture of awareness and sensitivity at all levels. Their success, according to those who are there today, lies in that process of institutionalizing servant leadership. And then there is Johnsonville Sausage, among my mom's favorite products. Uh, each team member there is encouraged to take pride and ownership of their work and results. We're a company that puts people first, people before profits. We can also tap into the data that demonstrates servant leaders build a desire in their employees to serve their customers through the development of a climate, climates and morale within team structures, the kinds of environments in which employees are willing to go above and beyond what's required to serve customers. So yes, the servant leadership concept has been operationalized in for-profit concerns with great success. But what of other compelling reasons to make that case for the best test. Over the course of the past 12 months, most of us have been shaken by the seemingly daily influx of striking images that depict unmet needs, images that serve to remind us of the consequences of applying a lower standard of care. Next slide, a few months ago, approximately 6,000 families lined up in cars for hours to collect just a few boxes of food. Hunger, hunger remains a persistent challenge in America, only worsening over the course of the pandemic. And according to the Food Research Action Council, about 11% of households in the US experience food insecurity. In our home state, one of the wealthiest per capita in the nation, as late as 2018, New Jersey had an overall food at overall food insecurity rates among New, New Jersey was considered to be among the lowest in our country with respect to overall food insecurity rates again in 2018. In February of this year, next slide, an unanticipated severe cold snap crippled nearly the entire state of Texas for four days. The local utility failed to put in place the kind of contingency planning to maintain sufficient power to meet demand during sub-zero weather conditions. Look at all the orange and the red there, where you see bright orange, yellow and red, you're looking at 10, 20, 30, 
or more percent of counties suffering from power outages. In accordance to this myopic yet conventional wisdom applied to the Lone Star State, the thinking was, well, why winterize? Snow and frigid temperatures are rare occurrences here, but perhaps foresight, foresight and conceptualization, again, seeing and acting beyond day-to-day -day realities to shape large visions could have saved the 80 lives lost in Texas in February and prevented the misery suffered by millions of Texans who went without heat and hot water for days. Applying a best test results in extreme forecasting that compels movement beyond short-sighted thinking. And then there is, next slide, the recent rise in targeted hate building on a long history of bigotry, racism that has plagued this country in ways that lead to conveniently naming and scapegoating any and all who are deemed different, who are deemed other. But permitting a climate of tolerance and indifference that allows for the random and vicious and brutal assaults on any group of citizens flagrantly ignores Greenleaf's admonishment against intentional harm. So as I close, I return to where I began with an invitation to consider, final slide, and adopt a higher standard of serving a higher bar for working at the institutional and individual level to forge a more just and caring society. Let's keep the conversation going. You can visit us here in President's Hall. We're right next door to the Center for Vocation and Servant Leadership in room 4A. Um, but as my, as my younger staff will tell me, I should also do a plug with respect to finding us. So Francie, if you can go to the last slide on the across social media platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, Facebook. It's been a pleasure. We'll open up for Q&A, be led by Father Colin. Happy, happy Servant Leader Day. And thank you. Reggie, Reggie, thank you thank so much. You so much. Very, very, very grateful, grateful for your, your words word today, today, for your time among, among us, us, and, and uh, uh, for your, your servant leadership, leadership here, here on, on campus, campus and um, with the Greenleaf Center. I think I we've think had some action, action on our, our uh, chat. Francia, are you taking the lead? Are you watching the chat? Uh, how I see a question. How do we measure if students are developing servant leadership in our undergraduate programs? Do I have that question right? So again, I think that um, it's so important to thank you so much for that question. Um, I, one of the great things about Seton Hall, and one of the reasons why I was happy to assume this uh, opportunity here, is the reality that this is a university that has embraced a tradition of service and a tradition of serving, um, supporting young people in being a part of a range of uh, service projects uh, and opportunities to give back um, throughout Essex County. But that, I should say, is not necessarily servant leadership in all cases. I think it's important to help our young people as they acquire um, meaningful experiences through these experiential learning opportunities to recognize or at least begin to question how they are touching others what they're gaining from the experience itself, and also moving beyond this whole notion that they might be the only ones in that relationship that are, that are actually giving. You know, 
if you're forming those more meaningful relationships, uh, there's some reciprocity. Um, I think a number of our folk, including a number of my students, uh, I'm pleased to say, clearly, um, those who've had the more meaningful experiences are those who are able to talk about how they've been transformed by the experience beyond the mere hours of service that they've given in that situation. Thank you again for the question. And I'm tracking these questions on. I see on Walter's one. tracking and others. There's another question by Tara. Tara Hart. You want to give me that? Yeah. Um, how can we as an employer best incorporate meaning questions around servants? OK, leadership in the hiring process. OK, so the question I believe is how can employers incorporate What's the other part of it? Uh, employers best incorporate meaningful questions around servant leadership in the hiring process. Um, so, so great question. Um, I think again, it's about as you think, as we all think about HR and onboarding experiences, um, establishing the tone up front uh, for those individuals who are joining our organizations, um, making it very clear that it is an environment in which everyone's voices, all voices will be one welcome, all contributions will be welcome, but also an environment that places an emphasis on going back to Greenleaf, optimal growth and development. And so in the hiring and onboarding process, how that employee can understand ways in which he or she will have opportunities to engage in opportunities to continuously grow. What are the processes that will enable me as a person joining this team to take advantage of uh, growth possibilities, um, promotional opportunities. But even if I choose to stay where I am for some time to even grow in the role in which I might find myself in. Great question. Uh, OK, will you please comment on servant leadership versus servant? I don't see the rest of that. Servant learning. Servant learning. Yeah, OK, so thank you for that. So I want to I'll repeat that for a reason. The the, the distinction between servant leadership and servant learning. Uh, the 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 latter does not necessarily equate to the former. <laughs> uh, service learning um, is wonderful. Um, I think it assists and helps in building certain skills and competencies, but those activities, those actions do not necessarily equate to the young person acquiring a deeper level of consciousness. What's the meaning behind your acts, your actions? What's the meaning behind your service? And I think when you think about or consider the best test, there are those opportunities to go a bit deeper about the nature, the value of one's involvement. Um, and I think that there are opportunities to even introduce that level of consciousness even to young people. I think this is actually um, a, a, a more ideal uh, environment to begin to raise these kinds of questions as we have uh, young folk in their formative years. We most recently uh, at the Center for Serving Leadership launched a pilot with the nearby Orange Public Schools um, known as our Next Generation Initiative. Um, the program itself is known as the Orange Ambassadors of Service in which we're going to begin to work with young people to begin to ask those questions. They will engage in our um, virtual courses, if you will, learning about the principles and practices of serving leadership in exchange for earning service learning hours. So I'll stop there. I hope I answered your question. You have another may I, I, Reggie, may I chime in with a question? This is Father Colin uh, without uh, uh, heading to the chat. Um, Mr. Lewis, here's um, something that I wrestle with a lot. Um, in the opinion of um, Robert Greenleaf, in the opinion of all of you at the Greenleaf Center, um, can any human be a servant leader? 
Um, <laughs> is it is it is it nature or nurture? Is it gift? Is it training? Is it some place like most things in this world? Some place in the middle? Um, any thoughts? I'm hearing two questions, at least two questions. Um, uh, on the first, I think we all have the potential to serve. Um, I'm not certain if uh, we have some of our MLK scholars who were invited to the event, but Dr. King did say it best. You know, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. Um, and serve in ways in which you're not always in the spotlight. Um, nature versus what was the other part of your question, Father? Nature versus, versus nurture. nurture. Right. Gift, grace versus yeah. Yeah. skill acquisition, training. I, I do think that one of the things that we have worked very hard to do, and this predates my arrival at the center, is to distinguish ourselves from, say, other leadership development organizations um, in that it's not merely about the development of skills and or competencies, however important they are, but that there is something about the values applied to um, our space that we claim in the form of developing, improving the craft of leaders vis-a-vis -a, -vis a servant leadership approach. And so there is, there are obviously folk like yourself, Father Colin, who come right out into the world ready to lead. <laughs> and then there are many of us who could use some nurturing, who could use some supports, um, who could use um, the benefit of being connected to communities in which we're all growing and developing together. Um, and that's some of the, 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 um, uh, the work that we're trying to do through the various programs at the Center for Servant Leadership. Organizations are often profit driven. Do you have, I'm only seeing part of that question. Uh, so do you have any suggestions or resources that might support a shift in culture towards servant leadership? Yeah, so I wish I had all the answers to great questions like that, but I will say again, in thinking about the examples I use today, that decisions were made by the leaders of those organizations to think about other in some ways non-traditional approaches that lead to profitability and or sustainability and so uh, whether you're thinking about the starbucks example or even the whole foods example the bottom line is that their leadership made a conscious approach to invest in people in ways in which the benefits of that investment manifested in higher rates of retention, um, higher levels of employee engagement, and yes, an improved bottom line. Pe people who want to come to work and then people who want to come to work and actually work um, usually help the organization to meet some major objectives. Thank you for the question. Mr. Lewis, Father Colin again, do you, um, do you, um, yet get much pushback you mentioned southwest airlines you mentioned starbucks you mentioned whole foods um are there some out there who find the whole idea just much too squishy forgive me for using the technical term well um sometimes squishy is what we need right <laughs> uh, well i i purposely talked about for-profit organizations who are successful. Um, I even alluded to a bit of the data produced by uh, Bob Lighton um, out of the University of Illinois. Um, we do have some evidence to support that um, there is not only great value with respect to this, um, but there are some proven results that can stem from this work. Um, it's not necessarily for me to convince everyone per se. Um, I think that when we have champions like Starbucks and others who have paved the way, I could have mentioned TD Industries in Texas, which has been doing this work for 30 or 40 years, and there's scores of others. 
Um, I think we have a reason to think about a form of inclusive leadership that not only, again, leads to greater levels of sustainability, but huge benefits for all those communities served by those organizations. I see when creating a good climate to help people go above and beyond and the rest of that. Uh, when creating a good climate to help people go above and beyond, usually giving benefits to employees, can this concept be applied to volunteer organizations that are searching for long-term volunteers? Absolutely. I think that, and thank you, thank you for that question, because I think that when we provide opportunities, meaningful opportunities for individuals to volunteer and give of their talents and gifts. When they themselves, when, when people volunteer with the range of charitable um, organizations out there, when those individuals walk away, touch in, in a profound way themselves, when they can talk about ways in which they have become better individuals, that makes them what? That tends to make them wanna come back and be a part of that work in some other way. Um, volunteers are, are often individuals who become a part of, of say, a pool of potential trustees. Um, volunteers can become um, eventual donors. And so building those relationships so that the volunteers are engaged in meaningful, I would say, well-organized activities. So one of the worst things you can do is to pull somebody in and not give them um, a meaningful, uh, more structured experience in which they have the opportunity to actually provide and lend their gift. But when they have that meaningful experience, they tend to want to come back. They tend to want to return. They tend to want to um, maintain some association with the actual organization. And therein lies opportunities for the leadership of that organization to actually grow and deepen that relationship. That's a great question, and thanks for asking. Mr. Lewis, um, maybe not a great question, but a question anyway. Um, uh, not so long ago, I was speaking to someone in business, someone of my vintage, more or less my age, and he was speaking about the young people who worked in his organization and said, um, from what he remembers of himself at that age, he finds his young people um, that they are kinder to one another they work better with one another. They are um, more collaborative, he thought, and less competitive than um, he remembered himself to be when he was just beginning. Any sense of that among our young people? Any sense that there may be uh, richer, more fertile soil for servant leadership today than might have been yesterday? Yeah, I think that there is promise a great deal of promise in our young people. And I'm biased because I get to spend a lot of time with uh, two of my favorite people on the planet. And they happen to be uh, my 17 and 20 year old nephews um, who give me a run for my money. Um, and so, you know, how many times, Father, have we been in conversations in which we're around some of our perhaps family members, even colleagues, who talk about some of the regrettable things that we might see today with respect to things occurring with our young people. But in truth, for any of us who are a part of this conversation today, who've been around young people, then you probably have some of the same experiences that I have, even those young people I've touched beyond my nephews. They often yearn, not necessarily for you to be their friend, but they yearn for that loving structure and guidance they want to be a part of loving circles. They want to be a part of finding their way in the world. And so young people represent, Father, the fertile ground. Um, again, I have hopes with our next generation initiative with the Orange Public Schools. Um, I love my classes here. I saw my colleague, Nancy Enright, we talk often about um, those opportunities to um, connect our young people in the core to meaningful experiences and then sort of 
complement that with the richness of our texts and literature. Uh, so I'm I'm hopeful, Father Colin. I'm very hopeful. What are some ways that we as members of the Seton Hall, and it cuts off on my end. Uh, what are some ways that we as members of the Seton Hall community can offer support to the Greenlee Center? Aha, very, very good. So this next generation uh, initiative will, will grow. Our hope is to um, eventually, if the superintendent got his way uh, at the uh, Orange District, uh, we would actually touch every entering freshman class um, beginning in 2020 for the school year for 2022. So there'll be opportunities to connect volunteers in the, in the capacity of mentors, if you will. Um, we are using a term known as servant leader exemplars. I can see some of my wonderful colleagues and members of faculty um, um, being a part of some of these virtual sessions helping to connect our young people there um, with principles and practices with respect to servant leadership. Um, we have a webinar series that we just kicked off in which we are literally inviting um, members. We have we are a membership organization, um, uh, but we're also inviting um, uh, uh, members who are directly tied to the Seton Hall community to be a part of these monthly conversations in which we connect practitioners with those who have an interest in learning more about servant leadership. Um, there will be opportunities there to actually appear on that webinar, also take part in those monthly conversations. I mentioned one of our guests uh, was uh, Howard Pahar in March. Um, we also um, were fortunate to have um, uh, Jack Lowe from TD Industries in January, and um, for a number of you who are into uh, who are active in the social justice uh, space, we will have Dr. Chris Purnell with us um, on April. What is it, Walter? April 27th um, as our webinar guest, talking about inequities um, faced by communities of color. Uh, so there are plenty of ways to be connected and engaged with the work that we have taking place at the Greenleaf Center, and I welcome. I welcome your involvement. Well, Mr. Lewis, we have very much welcomed your time with us today. Um, ooh, there's something. I see. How do you recommend mm -hmm. certain leaders take care of themselves? And what's the lesson, the other part of it? And not get burned out. Oh, burned thank out. you. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Um, <laughs> how do you avoid burnout in, in the academy? OK, well, um, one of the great things about um, Robert Greenleaf, um, particularly for those of you who follow him closely, um, if you think about his um, publication, his 1977 publication, um, The Journey into Legitimate Greatness, he, he mentions a concept uh, in that publication um, known as the art of systematic neglect. Um, and he couches that around a section um, known as withdrawal. Um, and as I taught servant leadership at Rutgers before coming here to Seton Hall, one of the things I would often say to these students in the area of public policy and public administration is that I wish I had known about the art of systemic neglect and withdrawing um, in my capacity as a, a city administrator. Um, burnout is very real. It off, it happens whether we're in so-called um, um, major uh, positions of responsibility for large organizations or or in my case, um, running a small shop like the Greenleaf Center. Um, but the art of systemic neglect allows the leader to think about literally stepping back to nurture and replenish. Um, and that's one of the concepts, by the way, that we are um, even gonna introduce with the young people through the pilot with the Orange Public Schools. Um, it requires practice, it requires discipline to prioritize in a way in which as another friend says to me, you focus on the vital many versus the trivial, um, the vital, the vital few versus the trivial many. Um, so prioritizing regularly, making certain that 
those things that are most critical to the well-being of the organization um, get your attention and at the same time never ever failing to uh, uh, hold on to a form of self-care um, being able to systematically withdraw and sometimes neglect some of those uh, trivial many if you will uh, that distracts and uh, inhibits our ability to actually be our best selves. Thank you for the question. I see a question from my colleague Nancy. I think you're on mute. Nancy, you, you're muted, Nancy. Uh, you, you're on mute, Nancy. Yeah, 100%. Am I OK now? OK, there Can you, you go. <laughs> OK, thank you. I, I'm having technological difficulties, so I apologize. Um, no, I just wanted to say I like, loved your talk. I thank you for your talk. And I just am so grateful that we have the the head of uh, the Greenleaf Foundation teaching in the core. And I just, the first, practically the first conversation that Reggie and I had, he spoke about, his, you know, his experiences teaching. I, I started talking about the core and I could see that he was passionate about this. And so we were so fortunate to, to enlist him in teaching journey. He's going to be teaching for us again in the fall. So we're just very grateful for you. Uh, I just wanted to say mm -hmm. that. Gr grateful for you, Nancy, and my colleagues in the core. Thank you. And Thank Nancy, you. Nancy, this is Father Colin. Grateful for you for not giving up on the technology and finding a way to getting yourself <laughs> unmuted for a moment. For a moment, I thought we were going to have to save your comments for the tenth annual. Oh, yeah, seriously, it's been that kind call. of day, Father Colin. It's just you know, I've been I've been with the tech people online, so I have I have this on my phone. So it's a little different, uh, but we got we got past it. So. Well, grateful that you are here, uh, Mr. Lewis. So grateful for your. Um, time here with us for your um ooh to have we time for one more other question thank you so much for your presentation says anthony painter to what degree is a servant leader one who says what others need to hear rather than what they may want to hear yeah yeah so th thank you for that question part of um when we we're talking about the characteristics um when talking about empathy i also talked about um, acceptance. Um, the servant leader is accepting of that individual for who is she, for for where he or she may find themselves. But the servant leader, the servant leader is also out of the concern and value for that person's growth and reaching his or her fullest potential. Will lovingly, if you will, I can say that in the Catholic University environment. <laughs> um, work with that individual to continue to grow. So there is acceptance, um, but not necessarily just simply talking about how I can feed you what you may want to hear. Some of that is lovingly helping the individual to grow and understand areas in need of improvement in order to become the individual uh, that he or she is meant to be. Great question. Well, Mr. Lewis, thank you. Here's something we need to hear, though we may not want to hear. I think we've come to the end of our time together this <laughs> afternoon and this ninth annual Servant Leadership Day. Thank you for your time. Um, I think all of us um, humans, young and not so young, um, we hunger for connection. We hunger for community. We hunger to give ourselves to something of meaning and purpose and um, we are grateful to have you with us um, for this hour to um, take some time to rest together and reflect a little. We are grateful for the tech professionals who have brought us together. We're grateful for um, Colleen and Hank D'Alessandro for their generosity. Grateful to the Center for Vocation and Servant Leadership and the professionals in mission and ministry. And to all of you for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, may um, your evening be good and um, let us 
work and pray together that the, the future of service and leadership may be bright indeed. Thank you all so much. Thank you.